You are listening to the Fly the W670 podcast. It's episode 23 of season number three, Crawley's Cubs Adventures in Mesa. Don't forget to listen. Don't forget to download. Don't forget to review. Most importantly, subscribe to the podcast. Follow us on the socials, Fly the W670 on Twitter, Instagram, and Fly the W on Facebook, or email us at fly the w670 at gmail.com. Well, Crawley, happy start to the new week. And uh, I know you had a good St. Patrick's Day out in Mesa. Yes, Vini Vidi Vici. I came, I saw, I conquered Arizona, man. That's all I can tell you. I'm tired. My liver hurts, but I flew the W, Dustin, not once, not twice, three times. Three times, trice. Trice, exactly. It was um, beautiful. I mean, we had just a great time. And just, you know, the way that it usually works for me is I start each and every day getting to Sloan Park at 9 a.m., um, you know, helping set up the Club 400 tent. And then I jumped around and took a couple pictures if you're on the SCORE, 670 The SCORE YouTube channel. Um, but we kind of, you know, we put the tent up. And then what I like to do then is go to the backfield. So I'm there at 9 a.m., put the tent up, walk to the backfields. And that's where you get to see prospects playing. Now, the cool thing about the time that I came with is with all the cuts, you get to see a lot of top, top 30 prospects in those backfields. PCA, Kevin Alcantara. A uh, whole bunch more. Then I got to watch Ian Happ and Nick Magical as they were working on their rehab. So I streamed some of that off of Twitter, which was really cool to see. Now, Dustin, the one surprise for me was seeing Mark McGuire in a Cubs uniform. Big Mac. Take a look at this one, Dustin. Boom. There he oh, is. Oh, and a, and a selfie. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, Big Mac, his son Mason was drafted by the Cubs. So he's out helping, you know. So, uh, hopefully, you know, if they can get uh, Big Mac in a Cubs uniform, we can get a uh, Sammy Sosa in a Cubs uniform. What do you think? Well, I've got a lot to say about that. Um, interesting times. Do we want to get into the Sosa thing right this second, or we want to wait a we'll second? We'll get it or? for the next episode, just because we, we're going to have some uh, additional footage and some fun stuff. I, to I just don't know. I just don't know how much Sammy either helped or hurt himself on this trip. I'll leave it at that. Sounds fair, but, um, you know, when we take a look here, um, you know, Mark was actually really nice though. So what I usually do then is I head back to the club 400 tent roughly around like 11 AM. And this is a picture of us here. We, you know, or that's not that one, but we'll usually end up, you know, just kind of grabbing some beers. We're talking and it's, it's just a lot of fun. We just have huge crowds that come out there. And so, you know, we drink beer, eat some of JP's world famous pizza. And then the players start arriving from the different fields to get to Sloan park. Now, especially with the big crowds out there, the bigger players take the golf cart to the stadium. They take like a back way that stands be Swanson, Ian Happ, those kind of guys. But the rest of the players, they all walk along the path and you can get autographs and pictures with various players, um, media personalities. There's our friend, Ron Coomer. Uh, he oh. said, hello. You, you get a guy like you get at least Menneker. I was talking to him. She wants to, she wants to uh, jump on the fly, the W podcast. And uh, how about this a little PCA action? Nice. He does. He always does that that thing that a lot of young teenagers do. But he's a uh, you know just really great with me. So now once I once that's done, they all get past there. Once the anthem starts, that's when I head in. And usually I head to my spot in the left field berm where I sit there and I just like to relax, enjoy myself, be in the grass, be in the sun, enjoying a nice cold beverage or in this case a nice big beer bat. Um, God, those are not cheap, Dustin. I'll just tell you that much. But, uh, you know, it's just for the experience. But here's what happened. What did you, first what did you game have I, in that? What did you have in that? What, since we're there, what, what 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 flavor did you have? Boy, was it – was it? I can't even remember, <laughs> to be honest with you. I think it was Miller Light or Bud Light, one of those lights. Some some, some Bud Light, some beer, a whole bunch of beer went down easy. But you, so usually that's what I do. I head to the left field burn. But Shota was pitching at that first game I went to, right? So I wanted to get some really good pictures for the podcast and for the socials. So my friend Steve and I, we walk in. I said, look, man, I just want to go sit in the very first row as close as we can get. Let me take three pictures. And then when we get kicked out, we go back to the berm. Dustin, I'm in the very front row behind home plate. No one came for all nine innings. Nice. So, so, you, so you, stayed, you stayed for nine innings at the uh, front row seat. Front row seat with Shota Imanaga pitching. And oh, my God, Dustin, it was so much fun. This is a picture that I took. Um, this is how close the, the hitters were right there to me. Michael Bush is warming up right there. And then this was at the end of the game, we were right there. And so it was absolutely amazing. And the thing about Shodi Minaga, Dustin, is that it's one thing to see him on TV, but to be that close and to actually see 
all the movement on the pitch, uh, on his pitches, the, the deception in his delivery. It was awesome. I had so much fun watching that. Yeah, that would have been something really cool to see. And hopefully we'll uh, get to see a lot more of uh, Shota because uh, he is uh, looking pretty good so far this spring training. Yeah, he went 4.1 innings. He didn't give up a single run, three hits. He struck out nine batters. Uh, Cam Sanders came into the game, finished the inning. Yancey Almonte went one and gave up a walk in two Ks. Uh, Carl Edwards struggled with his control. He gave up a run, walked three, and gave up a hit while striking out one. And then Daniel Palencia and Edwin Escobar pitched scoreless innings. On offense, Dustin Nico led off the game with a single, and Seiya Suzuki, who has been on fire all spring, but especially when I was there, hit a double to give the Cubs a one nothing lead. Mike Talkman would hit a sack fly in the fourth, and, Dave, and, and Dustin in the eighth. David Bodie hit a solo home run. And so Bodie is tied, Dustin, for second in the Cactus League with five home runs. He has been so, putting on some uh putting up some power numbers, no doubt about that. Absolutely. The Cubs won the game three to one against Oakland, so I get to fly W number one. I was so excited, Dustin, for Friday for the spring breakout game. We saw the weather reports were not looking good, right? And they wouldn't even let us pull into the parking lot, like into the tailgate lot. So we parked in the regular lot and we brought the tent and the beer to the tailgate lot. We were the only ones there. It's kind of raining kind of on and off all morning, but we just figured, hey, you know, if it stays like this, they'll probably try to get it in. But oh my God, all of a sudden Amon soon came and we even got hailed on. I didn't even know that was even a thing <laughs> in Arizona. Um you know, when Sammy came back, health froze over apparently. But here, right here in this picture is us. We are the only ones in this. Usually that entire picture, that lot is full. It's just Classic. the three of us right there. And it got so bad, we had to put it down so it was just over us acting like an umbrella. Classic. Now, Classic. they went and we got into the game. They let us into the game. The grounds crews trying their best to keep the field dry, but it's an absolute losing battle. Now, one cool thing about that game that was, so, you know, was supposed to happen was after the game. They were going to have autograph sessions with the prospects, but they decided to do it before the game while the grounds crew was working. So we were able to get autographs and pictures with all the top prospects. Um, there were six tables spread around the concourse with eight players, four Cubs and four White Sox. So you go there and you can get selfies with them. And, and uh, you know, the players were really nice. And I said, OK, um, it was cool. I, I, I just I really wanted to see that game. But hey, you know what? I've had one amazing weekend here i decided dustin that you would want this owen casey picture here's an owen casey uh nice. giving it the thumbs up so he was great um just really really fun and, and unfortunately the game couldn't be played so we were cold we came back end of the day but they were and, able and to they're get not it. making that and they're not making that game up no that game will not be made up so we don't get that till next year potentially Correct. If, if MLB decides to go forward with it again, which I'm sure they would. Uh, surprisingly, though, Dustin, they were able to get the game in at Glendale. It was uh, the veterans went to the White Sox Park while the prospects were supposed to play at Sloan. And so, you know, the veteran and Co Cubs and Sox players got eight innings. Brendan Davis, back from the concussion, was in the lineup. Great to see. He led off the scoring in the second inning. After Canario hit a double, Brennan also doubled to make it one nothing. Then Miles Mastroboni hit their third double in the inning to make it a 2 nothing lead. Jordan Wicks looked really good, I thought, Dustin. You know, I mean, I know, again, the box scores, but I was able to kind of watch some of the pitches and this stuff. I thought he looked pretty good. As he stretches out, you know what I mean? These guys, you can see when they start to get a little bit tired. And that, that's what I saw with Jordan. You know, when he went five innings, gave up four hits, three runs, one walk, and two Ks. Uh, he gave up a leadoff walk in the bottom of the second, and Paul DeYoung homered to tie the game. Andrew Vaughn hit an RBI double in the third. Lighten, Lighter and Colton Brewer pitched scoreless innings. The Sox took this one, three to two. I was not at the game, so I don't take that L. But, uh, you know, it, <laughs> that one only, uh, that, they only went eight innings and then the rain affected it enough. So, right, right. you know, I'd been to one game, you know, it was a three run game, you know, a three, one win. And this was going to be my second game on Saturday. There was a split squad. But at Sloan, they put on a fireworks show in the bottom of the first. How about this one, Dustin? Suzuki, Bellinger, and Jan Gomes back to back to back. And the Cubs led 3 nothing. I mean, we were barely sitting down, and we were getting bombarded by home run balls. Um, in the top of the third with two on, MJ Melendez hit a three-run blast to tie the game. But that was nowhere near as cool as hitting three solo home runs, in my opinion. Um, the Cubs were able to take back the lead in the bottom inning when Say had doubled and Jan Gomes hit his second home run of the game to make it five to three. 
And then the Cubs scored two more in the bottom of the fourth when Seiya Suzuki hit his second home run of the day. Casey got two runs back when Cam Demery hit a two-run homer to make it 7-5. to five. That was the second home run Drew Smiley gave up that day. He went 4.1 innings and gave up five hits on four runs, one walk, three Ks. But Dustin, here come the home run issues, you know, two home runs. Um, not good. Quas, Neris, Alzali, and Merriweather all pitched well. Neris gave up a run, but Alzali struck out two batters he faced. He didn't give up a hit. Merriweather struck out the side. The spring, though, Dustin, looking at the spring right now with Drew Smiley, he's pitched 11.2 innings. He's given up four home runs. We got to assume he's going to be in the starting rotation with an injury to Tyone. But, is, I mean, I mean, again, spring training, working on things. We've all kind of yada da yada da but I'm starting to get a little bit nervous. I'm not going to lie. Well, he's the guy that uh, I don't think should get that start. I, I, I don't um... – I don't think he should get that start. They're talking about potentially four lefties in the starting rotation with the Cubs if it was like happening this week. Right, right. It just, it's, uh, I wonder who they're going to play. I wonder who's, you know, we got a lot of questions, but I, I think that would be goofy with all the lefties. But the way, you know, it's like if you can get guys out, I don't care who you throw, but he just keeps giving up home runs. And that, that was the problem last year. And so maybe the answer, Dustin, was at the second game of the split squad. That was Ben Brown on the mound. And so, you know, who knows? I, I got a feeling at some point in time, Ben Brown will make his debut at Wrigley as a starter. He didn't disappoint. He went four innings. He gave up no runs on three hits. The key, Dustin, one walk and four Ks. I mean, that's it for Ben Brown. It's with a lot of these young guys is that when you are facing the major league hitters, they're not going to be swinging at stuff that some of the minor league hitters are. You're going to have to make sure that you're getting these swing and misses. So good game for Ben. Really love to see it. Keegan Thompson struggled. He went 1.2 innings. He gave up two runs on two hits, one walk and one K. The offense struggled, but Morrell went two for two with a home run and a walk. Dustin, did you see that home run absolutely leave the yard in Tempe oh Diablo? Gosh. I mean, it just flew off the bat. I mean, just the sound off the bat absolutely was one of those things that, you know, that's that's why they're giving him every chance at third base because you need that bat in the lineup. Yes, he could DH, who knows, but I, I really – it was just such an impressive home run. It was unbelievable. Um, Dustin, I'm, I'm going to be honest. I really wanted to come home undefeated, so I had one more game on Sunday. Got the news that Ian Happ would be in the lineup as a DH, and it got off to another good start with another Seiya Suzuki double. He would score on a sack fly by Cody Bellinger. In the third with Miguel Amaya on second, Ian Happ hit a RBI double to put the Cubs up two to nothing. So good to see Happ, you know, first game back, and all of a sudden, boom, two nothing. So the Rangers scored uh, on in the, in the fourth off uh, Javier Assad, who went 3.2 innings, gave up four hits, one run, and four Ks. But he seemed to tire out in the fourth inning. Scores two to one, flying along. And I'm like, man, I want this game to go a little bit longer. My last game. All of a sudden, the Cubs exploded for six runs in the sixth. Jake Slaughter with a three-run blast. Michael Bush tripled and scored on a Nico Horner single. And then Christian Franklin hit a two-run home run. run. The Cubs are up 8-1, right? No problem. I got my W flag getting ready to go. (laughs) The Rangers scored four in the seventh off Edwin Escobar and Sam McWilliams. One in the eighth off Dick Lovelady. But that was as close as the Rangers would get as I got to fly the W, like I said, three times. But, Dustin, the Cubs right now are third in the Cactus League standings. I know it doesn't matter. It just I I think it's nice when, you know, you see good numbers from players, good numbers and standings, trying to do the right things. And I think that that really kind of speaks about the depth of the system is that when, especially when other teams kind of pull the younger guys, you know, pull the veterans and they bring the younger guys in. The Cubs' younger guys are better than any other teams, in my opinion. Yep, I agree. It definitely shows the uh, the depth and what's coming down the pipeline. So that is very cool. The records don't matter. But hey, when it's going the way you want it to go, then I say run with it. This is the Fly the W670 podcast, Season 3, Episode 23, Crawley's Cubs Adventures in Mesa. Don't forget to listen, download, subscribe. To that Fly the W podcast, and don't forget, leave us a five-star review. In this segment, Crawley sits down with the 2016 Cubs World Series champion, Carl Edwards, to talk about that magical season and what he has learned from other organizations since he's left and what it feels like to be wearing a cubby blue uniform once again. Joining me now on the Fly the W podcast, I am happy to have on Carl Edwards Jr. Carl, Carl, how are you doing today? Doing great. Doing great. Nice to be here. 
Yeah. And so, you know, you are back. You were one of the 2016 World Series champions, and now you're back with Chicago here in Mesa. How enjoyable has it been for you to come back and see the old facilities again and, and meet some of the guys or see some of the guys again that used to be on that team? Uh, you know, it's been been pretty amazing, honestly. Just honestly, just being back in Cubby Blue has been probably like the highlight of my 2024 right now. Yeah, and you were part again of that 2016 and, and probably in one of the most pivotal moments in baseball history, game seven, 10th inning. Walk me through this. Obviously, Araldis Chapman gives up the home run. He may he be guts through that ninth inning, and then the rain delay comes. And when do you find out you are going in that tenth inning? Um, I found out when the Rodgers was still pitching. If he didn't get the last guy, I was going into the game, and he ended up getting the last out. And funny thing it is that um, once the rain delay started, Mike Montgomery mentioned to me, he goes, "Hey, see, like it's gonna be up to me and you." And we both was like, you know, hi, like, hey, bro, we got to do it. We just laughed. And then, I mean, <laughs> it ended up me and him last two pitches. Did the enormity of the situation hit you when you were on the mound? Did you, like, you know, like, there obviously 5 million people came to the parade. The amount of people that were just watching that game tuned in, did that get in your head or were you just locked in? No, it was more just, I mean, honestly, I, it's, it's, it's a weird feeling because I didn't feel too nervous. Is like, you know, but I, but I also feel like I had the right mindset. It was like, all right, just go ahead. Hey, they gave you a lead. Let's just get these three outs and, you know, go by our business. Um, but overall, I just think it was just, it was just one of those moments, like my moment. And I, and I remember afterwards, I think a lot of people remember you just in pure joy with that W flag around you. And that W flag had significant meaning for you, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, I was, you know, the big W is for, you know, we went us winning and plus it was the World Series. That's another W. And then the last, well, not the last part, but another part of it is my best friend, Will Beanball, that had passed away was, I mean, Will W. So um, I just think, you know, it just, I know it had unleashed so much. I had so much. I felt like a little kid all over again. And when you saw that parade, when you're on the bus and you are going down Lakeshore Drive, heading to Grant Park, I was I was in Grant Park, so like we didn't realize what was going on in the city. We had no clue. We we're just in this park until they put the TV monitors and we saw a massive humanity like we've never seen before. Like, were you guys just stunned at, at just how many people were out there? I mean, we were all stunned. I was really stunned because like I have not ever I never seen nothing like that. Like <laughs> And I mean, yes, everybody's dream to win the World Series, but for us to win it, and then <laughs> we didn't even leave the stadium, and it was people right there. And I'm just like, okay, nice. You know, I was thinking, oh, it's a nice crowd, and Jesus Christ, <laughs> <laughs> when we started rolling, bro, it was just like, it's like people, 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 and then we got to the stage, and that's where so many people, everybody started looking like ants at the back. <laughs> Now, you know, 2017, you guys make it to the NLCS against the Dodgers. You fell a little bit short. And, you know, that was another really, really good team. And the Dodgers just were hot at the right time. And I think you guys kind of maybe ran out a little bit of gas, you know. But it was in 2018, you get traded from the Cubs. Once you started leaving the Cubs organization, what was it like for you to go into different organizations? What did you pick up? Did you learn a lot from the different organizations you went to? Oh uh, yeah, I mean when I when I was traded away, I mean I learned a lot from you know other other organizations. Um, so I'm you know they have they kind of do the same thing, but they just have different ways of explaining it. And I think uh, the biggest my biggest um, curve for myself was that 2021 20, off season. And that's when I was just like, hey, I'm going to do this. I'm throwing this. And I'm just, you know, I'm going to do what got me to the big leagues instead of trying to be this person that I wanted to be. So I kind of just said I'm putting all my marbles in the bag and I'm going to do it, you know, my way. And I just go, you know, and if, if, you know, if everything don't work out, then, you know, I had a good career, got a World Series, got to meet a couple, you know, I got to meet a lot of guys. Um and got, you know, so, you know, and I was kind of just preparing myself, you know, you know, for networking and, you know, stuff that would happen after baseball. But, you know, by the grace of God, he was like, son, you're not done yet. So uh, how about we do this and boom, let me back here. 
Yeah, and, and and I started noticing, and when you were with Washington, I'm like, he's different. Like something, something's kind of clicked in there, and, and and I started to see just how you your your presence on the mound, your pitches, everything kind of just looked like I'm like, okay, this is Carl Edwards. Looks like he's he's back. And then now, you know, in the off season, I remember I was at Cubs convention, and you were in town at the same time, and I said mm-hmm. to myself. You know, Carl's looking for a team. I wonder if there are going to be any talking. When did you? When did you and your agent start kind of talking with the Cubs about coming back? Um, it was after I had left Chicago. Um, I had a signing up there, and it was just um, we were just talking. We had a couple teams out there that we was looking at, and we bought it down to you know two teams. And then at the end of the day, he was like, "What's your decision?" And we went with, you know, we came here. And it was like, I kind of, I knew everybody here. So it was kind of like, you know, go back, you know, people, uh, you know, you've been around the organization, so they know you and you just, you know, bring it up. Now, if our fan, for our fans listening, how's the Carl Edwards of 2024 different than the Carl Edwards of 2016, 2017? Um, I think that's the Carl Edwards we have is the 2016 Carl Edwards. There's no difference between him and the 2024. I feel like I'm going to have a great season, um, and I'm going to be like. And I honestly feel like the 2017 Carl Edwards Jr. is my best. Yeah, I remember that. You, had, yeah, you wait, <laughs> yeah, you were looking pretty sick back then. And then now, as you kind of take a look here and you come back, you know, you had Joe Madden as a coach, David Ross was a teammate, but now you're in camp with Craig Council. What has that been like as far as this spring training camp? Um, it's pretty much, you know, it's been pretty much the same. Um, Craig is great. I mean, he's he's one like I can feel like he's he's one of those managers that's that's willing to have fun with the team, and you know, he'll buy into some things that we may do, just you know, just some off fields, have fun type things. And I think um, with everything that's you know how we how we look at the season coming forward. I just think that we're going to have a lot of, we're going to have a lot of fun. And uh, one thing I always try to tell the guys, but the question me about, you know, when we won the World Series is, it's like, man, what y'all do? And I was like, bro, we spent a lot of time together. Off the field, like we had team dinners, you know, we had like, and then at the time, a lot of guys had charity events. So everything we did was kind of like, it's team oriented and it was a family and once you become a family and whatnot then you you know everything gets pretty much take care of yourself because now when we go out there and don't have that good game we know like at the end of the day I'll, we still have our family on our back and we go out there the next day and it's a different person why well, not different person but just different results and then now we're back on track now, Tommy Hadovy is the pitching coach. It was Bazio before, and now, I mean, two very different pitching coaches. What do you, what do you learn from Tommy's style of coaching? What does he kind of work with you guys on? What what do you think he brings to the table? Uh, Tommy brings a lot. He brings a lot just because. But I know Tommy since I was here. He was, you know, he was still here when I was here. He just was the pitching coach, and Tommy brings he brings the. I say he brings that the energy that you need, and he brings that confidence. And he's kind of like, you know, like he understands how hard this game is. So he's not trying to put too much on you. He's just really just trying to steer you in the right way so you can have success. Now, you know, this is going to sound weird, Carl, but in two years we hit the 10-year anniversary of that 2016 World Series team. Has that gone through your head? And do you keep in the communication with a lot of guys from the team? Um, I mean, I've talked to Justin Graham a good bit. Uh, that's probably like it. Me and Addison communicated a little bit here and there. Uh, but, I mean, it's kind of hard now because, like, once baseball is over, like, everybody has their family. Everybody, you know, now they become – you know, you got to be a family man. So they do a lot of stuff with the family. Me and us as, you know, teammates, like, yeah, at the field, or we can talk all day, but we usually just, you know, hey, check in, see how they're doing, and I just try to let them, you know, do what they got to do. When you, when you went out for your first spring training game back in Cubby Blue and the fans were there, I mean, you know, you've been to a couple of different parks, but there are no fans like Cub fans. Did you have, like, a little smile go across your face as you took that mound the first time and, and it's Sloan Park? Over ten thousand people. The place is packed. Yeah, I mean, it was one of those, like I don't know, it was, it was, it was one of those, like I was happy, 
but I was also nervous, but I was also excited. And it was just like, uh, okay. And then after the inning, you know, they clapped and stuff, and I was just like, whew, okay. Got first and out of the way. But like I and like I said too, it's like that's here, but I think the biggest test is when we get back to reading. That's gonna be the <laughs> Yeah. And now you, you have, you know, you're, it's funny because in 2016, you were one of the younger guys on the team. Now you're kind of more of a veteran. Do you give a lot of advice because the Cubs have so much young pitching here? Oh yeah. I'm, I'm constantly talking to these guys, telling them, you know, how to go about the business you know, on the field. Like one thing about it is that us as, like I tell, I said, look guys, I know we all want to be perfect and we all want to, you know, be the best ever. And I said, but we also have to understand and know ourselves that we're gonna have good days, we're gonna have bad days, we have so so days. You know, you're gonna have days when you wake up in the morning, you don't even wanna be there. But at the same time, we're a family and we all gotta do what we gotta do. We gotta hold each other accountable and just go out there and have fun. At the end of the day, this game's supposed to be fun. We gotta have fun. And the more fun we have, the better off we are. So if you were talking to the fans right now who are listening to this podcast, what do you think? What would you tell them as far as this 2024 Cubs team? What do they have to be excited about? Um, it's going to be a lot of excitement. It's going to be a lot of excitement. I, just, I feel like, and something went over me yesterday that gave me some feelings of that, you know, our 16 team. It gave me, it's just like looking on the field, watching the guys play. Um, it's just like something came over me, and I was like, man, we really, we really have a chance to be really, really good. And it's going to ball down to just everybody doing their part, having confidence, and you know, saying that "Go Cub" song, "Go Cub, Go" song, every home game. Well, CJ, I appreciate your time, and I really, really am looking forward to seeing you that first time that you come out at Wrigley because the crowd is just going to be ecstatic. And I'm thinking about when they announce your name, when Jeremiah Paprocki announces your name on opening day at Wrigley, and you're all lining up, man. You are, you know, you're going to get an ovation like you never heard before. That made my stomach too. <laughs> <laughs> Carl, thank you so much for everything you do, and uh, thank you for jumping on the Fly the W podcast. Yes, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it. This is episode 23 of season three of the Fly the W670 podcast, Crawley's Cub Adventures in Mesa. Don't forget to listen, download, subscribe to that Fly the W podcast, and leave us a five-star review on Tuesday night. Before the game, a ceremony was held in honor of Ron Santo, and he was inducted into the Cactus League Hall of Fame. His film son and a filmmaker, Jeff Santo, was there, and he talks to Crawley about his late father. Joining me now on the Fly the W podcast, I am happy to have on Jeff Santo. Jeff, how are you doing today? Doing great, Paul. How how are you, man? I'm hanging in there. You know, I'm trying to survive uh, Arizona. It, it, you know, boy, that, that sun takes a lot out of you, and so does the beer, right? <laughs> well, hey, man, you're there at the best time. The sun will take a lot out of you in the summer. Go there when it's 116. Oh, yeah. No, I'm going to pass yeah. on that. Yeah. But you were just out here mm -hmm. in Arizona. Uh, tell us what you were doing while you were here. Yeah, my dad was uh, inducted into the Cactus League Hall of Fame, which was a nice thing. You know, um, obviously the big one was the the, the big Hall of Fame uh, that uh, we waited on, and he waited on his whole life, and didn't happen when he was here, but but he got in, and that's the great thing. And now he's in the Spring Training Hall of Fame, which is you know it was beautiful. We went out there, the family got together, and uh, we had a great night. Yeah, and, and so, you know, they do this, and I don't know how long they've been doing it, but, but they, you know, it was this year they honored a few different people, Bruce Bochy, Ron mm -hmm. Santo, Rick Monday, Don Carson, who's a legend around here. And so, you know, it, it was a really, you know, good class. And, and you know, I think, I think your dad was just loved spring training and getting back out, you know, with baseball starting and being at Hohokam and later on, you know, being a part of that and, and that old ho ho com stadium used to be so tiny used to be a lot closer to the fans yeah you know spring training in general yeah we loved it as a family i mean i went out there as a kid you know me and my brother got tutored out there we were taken out of school and it started in old town scottsdale that's where the cubs were when when i was a kid in the 60s you know they even started you know in in la in long beach and then they went to catalina for a little bit but 
Scottsdale and Mesa has been the home uh, for my dad when he was on the Cubs, and we loved it, man. Uh, spring training is just a, a great time because you're, you're getting ready for the new year. It's like starting all over again. You know, you're optimistic. My dad was always optimistic that, that <laughs> this will be the year. You know, uh, they got close in 69, man, and, you know, that's that. But uh, we love spring training, and it was great to get back there and celebrate him again. So I have a couple pictures here taken by our photographer of, of the um, ceremony. And you can see, it looks like you guys are given a plaque here. Mm -hmm. And then you, Jeff, you're in this picture right here. Yes. With and my so, wife, Christy and my, yeah. my nephew, Sam and my brother, Ron Jr. Absolutely. And, uh, and then, yep, there's Sam throwing the pitch. There, and I think yeah. for a lot of Cub fans, we remember how he used to mention Sam on the broadcast a lot. And it, and it was like, Oh my God, look how, how big he's gotten. Right. Does, do you think that he really, Sam really understands or now maybe has a better idea grasping of what his dad meant or what his grandfather meant to all these Cub fans? Oh yeah. He, he knows. And, 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 you know, the thing with Sam is Sam and, and my dad were connected when, when Sam was born first grandchild and, and they lived next door to my dad, my sister and my dad, they had a, door that opened up into his backyard so he did everything with sam it was almost like he got a second chance to to raise another boy you know and it was beautiful and i i love seeing that relationship and, and how close they were and sam now being older you know he was in this old cub he was four years old switch hitting in this old cub you know uh back then when we did the documentary and it's just yeah it's, he he does he's taking it all in he understands what my dad has done and uh, the journey he was on and um yeah it's inspiring to all of us you mentioned this old cub and and, and you are a documentarian you, you you've mm -hmm. done feature films documentaries all sorts of different things it's this old cub ranks number four on indiewire per screen gross and sold over seventy five thousand dvds obviously that was a labor of love for you to be able to have your, you know, to be able to record your dad. And, and it was during a difficult time when he was trying to really, mm -hmm. you know, you showed everything, you know, how difficult certain, you know, with, with the amputations and all that stuff. Did you ever think the film would get that big or did you just want to have something special to kind of document what he was going through? Yeah. My mom gave me the idea. You know, I wasn't even thinking about doing, I did my first film already. I was in Hollywood you know, a lot of people don't know that. They thought, oh, he just did a film on his dad. No, this is this is what I was doing. So I'm glad I had that first film under my belt to really understand how I can capture my dad's story. And once my mom put me onto it, I had to actually ask my dad and sit down with him and say, hey, listen, dad. And this is while he was in the hospital, about to lose his second leg, right? And so he was like, I don't know, son. And and uh, he was apprehensive at first. That's that's kind of the Santa way. It's a no, 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 until you start thinking about it. Then it's like, oh, maybe this might be something. And I think the thing that turned him around was, yes, I can get my story out to all the diabetics out there that, you know, you can go for your dreams. No matter, you can, you can do a lot with this disease. You just have to accept it. And once he understood that that was the mission of the documentary, he was all in. Well, I don't know if all in, but he said, I'll give you two weeks and we'll see how it goes from there. And he never bothered me after two weeks. And so it was a, a passion project, but it was also something that, that I really just kind of tried to step back and take it as a filmmaker because I did have experience and, and to really show his story of what he did with this disease and, uh, you know, and, and how far he got with it. And I think, you know, a lot of people remember those stories, you know, obviously your dad did the walk for, the, for diabetes, for juvenile diabetes. Um, and then all the, all the stories that I've heard about when, when someone would say, oh, my, my niece has diabetes or my, my wife has diabetes, and he would literally call them and people would almost hang up because they thought it was a joke that why, why is Ron Santo calling me? I mean, that, I mean, obviously baseball was a huge part of his life and he loved the Cubs, but diabetes was right there as far as fighting that disease and trying to make, like you said, tell people that there is still a life after that. And boy, you see all the things that have come nowadays through the research, through different groups, all the different technologies now that have made diabetes even more manageable. Yeah. You know, and when he played, there wasn't much on it. Right. So him and my mom had to go to the, they were dating in high school and got married the, the, the year after high school. And they went and researched it at the, at the library, you know, so he didn't know anything about it. And then 
actually got diagnosed because his mother, my grandmother, said, get a physical before, you know, you go off to rookie camp. Because back then, the teams didn't do physicals. So he knew then he found out he had this, you know, high amounts of sugar in his urine. And then they found out he was a type one. He said, listen, I don't have any problems right now. I'm just going to go. And until it hits me, I'm not going to say anything. So he went there knowing he had a ticking time bomb inside him, which is amazing. You know, think about that psychologically to actually do that, knowing you're going for your dream. And yet you have this thing that's that's lying in wait that can grab you at any moment. And it did in 1961. He lost 20 pounds and then he had to, you know, he went to my brother's pediatrician and and the doctor said, hey, you, you, you can't leave here without insulin or you're going to die. You won't play. Ba- you'll you'll actually die. And so from there on out in the 62 season, he really had to regulate that insulin from night and day ball games. And that was amazing, man, because you think about it and you look at that season. He had a tough season that year because that's what he was doing. And he kept it a secret until he made his first all star game. The only one he told inside the cup organization was Dr. Sucre, who was a dear friend of his and was and, and kept it to himself and said, Ron, I'll help you through this. And he made his first all-star game. And that's when he told the organization that, that he had diabetes, but he still kept it a secret to the public. And, uh, I really, I really jump into this because I, I have peanuts, popcorn and cracker jacks, my podcast. And I get into my dad's psychological journey because it's a fascinating one and it inspires a lot of people. Yeah. And, and you, you know, you started that, uh, that, that podcast peanuts, popcorn and cracker jacks, and you've also had a lot of your dad's old teammates mm-hmm. and, 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 it, you know, it's, there's something different I think between players now and players then because they don't have you know back then they didn't have all the hype and the hoopla and the social media and people tracking them from the moment they're 12 years old they just kind of to me got to be really authentic real people you know what I mean they got to live normal lives they work jobs in the offseason just like you know most everyday normal people and so I think that there's something that when I listen to your podcast and I listen to those old players and I remember all the Cubs cons when Beckard and uh, Banks and Williams, they'd all be ripping on each other. I mean, there's something magical about kind of hearing those stories from those guys, because like I said, they seem so relatable to you and, you know, to me. Yeah, that's that's the golden era of baseball, man. And they did have second jobs. They roomed on the road. They they negotiated their own one year contracts. These were these were middle class guys. You know, uh, we, you know, they, they did well, but still not enough to, 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 to not have them go to work in the off season. And it was a special time because they were part of society. I remember my dad parked across Wrigley field at Vince's gas station there, uh, near Bernie's. And, and, you know, I remember getting out of the car with him, me and my brother and the fans just walking with him to the stadium and after walking with him. So they were really part of society. They weren't closed off. And there was something very special about that. Absolutely. Now, you know, we're, I'm in Arizona and there is always one Ron Santo moment in Arizona that sticks mm-hmm. out in my head. It was a Cactus League game and Pat and Ron are going to call this the Pat and Ron show. And Pat sits there and someone's blocking his view. And, and you know, Pat says, well, there's someone blocking my view. So doing play by play for the inning is going to be Ron Santo. And your dad just screamed, can you sit down, please? He's yelling at the guy. And I'm just, it was so much fun. And the Pat and Ron show is one of the most entertaining, you know, three hours of baseball you could ever have. You never knew what was going to happen. And how much did it mean to you to see Pat Hughes get that Ford Frick award? Oh, amazing. I had him on the show. Uh, we had a great conversation. My dad would have been so pleased by that. I mean, when him and Pat got together in the booth, that's when my dad really took off as a color guy because they were so comfortable together. They called the Pat and Ron show and um, they were just good. They were opposites. Right. And it, they worked great. My dad's this emotional man, this ex ball player that that spoke his heart and wore it on his sleeve. And I think, you know, you got to see another side of my dad because when my dad played baseball, he was a serious guy, you know, between the white lines it was all business to him, you know, and if you even watch some of the early, uh, you know, tapings of him in interviews, he's really spot on. He's, he was 20 years old when he got in the big leagues. That's very young, but he was very mature. It was like my dad knew his path, right? And he knew what, what he was good at. His dad left him when he was eight years old, and, and my dad just had this mission. And when he went to the broadcast booth, he was very insecure at first, very vulnerable, because this wasn't his thing. You know, he knew the baseball field, but up here, you know, and, and I remember Barry Rosner was very, very big on that. He told him to just be yourself, Ron. That's what people want to hear. And people got to see who my dad was. He really was a guy that was was humble. He made fun of his of himself, but he also knew the game like nobody else. 
Well, I got to be there when he was inducted into Cooperstown. Your whole family was there. It was it was an amazing moment. And, you know, Jeff, I really want to thank you and your family for sharing, Ron, with Cub fans for so many years. We had, you know, I would sit there when they would do the early entry. I'd get in right away with a bobblehead giveaway, and I would wait at the very kind of very top seats because I knew he would come up in the golf cart. And the second he came, I would spring up and just say, Ron, what do you think's going to happen? You know, yeah, it would just would get me so excited. And he, he never once – you know, treated me poorly. He always would just tell me what his thoughts on the game for, and then he'd go upstairs. And I just, it was so much fun. And to see him, you know, get honored this week. I mean, I, I just love it for you. I love it for your family and for all the Cub fans who will always have a special uh, place in their heart for Ron Santo. Jeff, if you could do me a favor, tell our listeners about your new podcast and where they can find you on the socials. Yeah, it's called Penis. Well, thank you for saying that, first of all, Paul. Yeah, my dad loved his, the fans, and he was all about the game, man. And uh, the game meant everything to him, very dedicated to it, and for a reason. I mean, he had it when he was a kid. That's what got him out of the inner city, got him, you know, to, to get off the streets. His mom and his sister raised him, basically. His dad left him when he was eight years old. So my dad really, you know, baseball was was his dream and 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 gave him a pathway to to be who he became um and my podcast i dive into just really uh growing up in the clubhouse my brother and i did that we have a different perspective on on life and the game because that's all we knew and i'm really following my dad's psychological journey after he passed away i really like to get into his journey because it also helps me discover my journey and others discover it because baseball you can really put together with life it's there's so much that happens in baseball that's comparable to life and that's what we're exploring in my in in the podcast. My wife and I, Christy, uh, we have a pretty good structure to it. We talk baseball, old time baseball, also today, present day. But we also talk about with entertainers that love the game because I'm in an entertainment business. So it has a lot to do with the experience I've gone through in life, what I've learned from my dad and my wife and I on our journey out here. And uh, I think it's fun. I think we dive deep psych psychologically. We like to discuss, you know, certain things, the meaning of certain things. And, and it's fun. I think a lot of people are liking it. Well, that's great, Jeff. I appreciate you giving us your time today. And thank you so much again yeah. for everything. Paul, appreciate it, man. And they can find it. We're on all the, the podcast platforms, uh, iTunes, Spotify. And uh, so, yeah, please support, support the podcast. Really love that, Paul. Thank you for saying that. Thanks for having no me problem. on. Take care. All right. Take care, man. Crowley, excellent job out in Mesa. That's a wrap. Don't forget to listen, download, review, and subscribe to the Fly the W podcast. Follow on all the socials, Facebook, Instagram. Of course, we're on Twitter. You can email the Fly the W podcast, fly the W670 at gmail.com. And you can watch us on YouTube by subscribing to the 670 to score YouTube channel. Crowley, safe uh, travels back. I'm sure you'll get some sleep on the uh, bird back to shy. A uh, little snowflakes uh, in the area as you uh, come back. So you're not bringing oh, the sun God. with you, unfortunately. <laughs> and we will uh, we will catch up again midweek. Great job. And I just want to thank everybody, um, you know, who, who stopped by the tent, who had kind words to say about the podcast. It, it was really great out there. The Club 400 tent just did a fantastic job. We all had a lot of fun. And I hope, Dustin, you can join us next year and for all our listeners to come out next year because there is nothing like Cactus League Baseball. Go Cubs! Hey guys, it's Crawley. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more content like this. If you want to see more of our videos, be sure to check out our playlist and let us know what you think in the comments below. Also, don't forget to follow us on social media to stay up to date with our latest episodes. Links are in the description. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you in the next video. Go Cubs!